testosterone injection that's gone bad. Uh, there's still some resistance, but doxycycline, Bactrim, and then there's that one called linazolid. So those, and, and plus or minus clindamycin. Clindamycin covers some MRSA, but not all. We've lost over time a lot of susceptibilities for some of these antibiotics that we've used in the past. But infections are on a spectrum. They're all flavors of skin germs. I tell people that when you leave your door open, meaning when you open your skin or puncture your skin, it's like inviting the criminals next door. But some of the criminals, you know, have misdemeanors and some of them are mass murderers. The bottom line is that if you have an infection or think you do, don't stick a needle in because a staph infection, what will happen, people do that and the next day it blows up. That's what we're talking about. So, so these germs are not to be messed with literally. So. Today's interview with an infectious disease expert, Dr. Mindy Pruitt. Welcome, Dr. Mindy Pruitt. Thank you. I'm Dr. Thomas O'Connor, a lifelong powerlifter, board certified physician, and published academic author. I've taken care of thousands of men on testosterone and steroids, and now I use my media appearances in this YouTube channel to provide education and harm reduction. Subscribe now so I can help you stay strong and healthy. All right, guys, this is incredibly timely, always as so many people in the world are taking steroids and, 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 and even testosterone. And most of these preparations are injections, intermuscular injections or sub-Q. We know that there is oral steroids. We're not going to talk about that today. This is an infectious disease expert. She's also a certified licensed testosteronologist that is under my training. She's not on testosteronology directory yet because she's she's working on getting her, her office set up and she's going to be phenomenal. Brilliant woman, brilliant doctor. She works in hospitals. She's an internal medicine doctor and she's sub specialized as a fellowship trained doctor as an infectious disease. The, the importance of who she is and what she does is the is the primary focus of how she's going to help us today. Dr. Mindy, tell us about when people inject their body with anything. Let's talk about the infections, how they start, how you differentiate them. Is it an infection? Is it something that's a bruising, a hematoma? Let's talk about that. So there are basically two ways to get infections into the bloodstream or into the skin. You can directly inoculate which is sticking a needle or having a bug bite or having an incision intentional, whatever that you have, or hematogenous spread. There's something else in the body that gets in the bloodstream. So what we're talking about today primarily are injection site infections that are given primarily through a needle and there are different ways for that. So we're talking about the mechanism of action when you break the skin using a needle. And these needles are sterile and most people have, have done this uh, when we've looked at the literature most people have been doing this for a while that get these types of infections. So um, it's not very often, but it's common enough. And it's certainly higher than the general population who doesn't use uh, any type of injection type medicines. Right. So we have a guy to kind of two. this is for, you know, the, for the for our population viewer scope of but like two guys and, and girls and girls. You know, the average guy here is just taking testosterone intermuscularly or subcutaneously, you know, the, the micro dosing, right? The doctors need to need to learn about this. Not every two weeks, doctor, not every once a month with Sipinate. It's not going to be optimal. So you're, you're breaking the skin. You're either direct, you're doing a deltoid injection, right? Posterior deltoid, a gluteal injection, or you're, you're doing the thigh. Mm -hmm. I know there's, there's different regions, guys. I know you can go into life. I know you can even inject, you can do it. That's the comp. Now, I've had probably half a dozen infections in my life that you inject in the deltoid and it's like, shit, is it, it's hurt, it hurts. Is, it, is that like a hematoma? Is that like a, a mass underneath that's painful? And is it, is it getting swollen? Is it red? Is it tender? And at what point, even as a doctor, do I give Keflex now or an antibiotic? We're going to go into it. You are the expert. 
We're going to talk appropriately, appropriately today on how do you differentially diagnose it yourself to make a decision when you're going to seek care and then what antibiotic. Because in the end of the day, I'm all about really open education for people to know as much as they can, always having access to great healthcare providers. This is just information for you guys. So these people are injecting testosterone. Let's talk about, so that, that's always going to be sterile. We hope if you get it from Walgreens, CVS, Publix, your, your, your you know, retail, a retail pharmacy, or a good compounding pharmacy in, in America or anywhere in the world that is compounding appropriately testosterone esters. Okay. So, but they can still get infections. So it's coming from somewhere else, right? From the skin. Hold on. Now, the other guys in the world are injecting from underground sources, Dr. Mindy, and I know you're pretty new to this. You're, you know, you're not one of the classic steroid users like me for decades, but you're coming into the world of hormones and testosterone, ology. So you, you, you have to understand a lot of people are getting poorly sourced gear. Right. And, and, and now the pharmacology guys will tell you from the streets, most of that gear even the guy that makes it in a bathtub, he's putting in a solvents, you know, alcohol. Forgive me, I'm not a biochemist or a pharmacist, and I'm not. I mean, they're using some type of, you know, sterilizing agent. So most even underground gear is not really dirty, but now it can be contaminated with heavy metals. It's not the drug that you think it is. It's not dosed properly. I mean, I have the intel, guys. I know the intel. So. But when you inject it, the sad thing that happens that we're going to focus right in here today is it's an injection. And then the, the patient, the person thinks, oh, it's a bad injection. It's, it's immediately an infection. And they may take antibiotics they have on hand. Maybe it's not. Dr. Mindy, when you have a bad local reaction to a, 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 what's to say intermuscular injection, it's we're talking testosterone esters from a steroid guy, other steroids, intermuscular or sub Q, please guys, what's to say intermuscular run, run professionally in your mind. How do we diagnose it and timelines from when it is an infection? And then we're going to, we're going to talk about what to do, how to triage and what antibiotics. Okay, so very good. So when you have an injection and you have a, a reaction, you're gonna have some redness and swelling. So it's not always clear if it's inflammation from something in the uh, substance that you're injecting or if it's an infection. So it's not always clear because you can have, you know, you can have a, a, a reaction from a flu shot. I mean, it's, it's flu season, you can have a reaction for that, a localized reaction. So when do you, worry about this maybe something else so <clears throat> i think the thing i'd emphasize first as an infectious disease doctor because i take care of sick people in the hospital um, is that systemic infection so if you have fever chills sweats i mean i think that's the first thing to just to bring everybody's attention that if you don't feel well or your significant other says you don't look good you're sweating that kind of thing that's an obvious go to the doctor kind of thing um, the other thing you can look for at the injection site is ob obviously purulence um, fluctuance is a, is a big deal. So when you have a hematoma, um, it, it can be a collection of blood. It can be swollen and kind of firm. Infection can look like that too. When infection does that, it causes more induration, but it can also be fluctuant like an abscess. So it can be softer. Um, a lot of times staph infections might start out hard and indurated. And then if, as you get treatment with antibiotics, they kind of ripen. Everybody understands kind of the ripening of the you know, pimple or bulls, you know, yeah. most people are pickers. So that's kind of a, a, the concept. And so that's the progression of this. You also want to look at the size. And so if you've got something bigger than five centimeters, um, it, if you've got a pretty big area that, that potentially, yeah, you, you might want to get that seen about as well. But I would say that the systemic first, looking at the site and seeing what that looks like. Um, history is always great. When we're internal medicine trained, physicians. And so you want to get a history. Have you ever had a staph infection? Because 
what you're trying to deal with is the landscape of what's on your normal flora. And so a lot of times the misconception, if you have a staph infection or if you strep or anything, is that you must have gotten it from somebody or somewhere or the hospital or wherever. And what I tell people is that your own skin is your that's where you're most likely going to get it. So anytime you step on a nail or have a needle, you have to consider different things. You have to consider, okay, what's going in my skin? That's the needle. And it should be sterile, right? For all practical purposes, we're saying this is sterile, right? right. Um, but it's what's going in your skin, what's on your skin, what could potentially be pushed into the skin. And most people are going to use alcohol, but I've seen videos. I've watched enough of this now to know that not, not all the time do people clean the skin off very well. And then when, when they, if you have someone else injecting for you, ideally that person would have washed their hands and, and use a cotton swab or not a cotton swab, but an alcohol prep to kind of make sure they're rubbing the skin before they inject. Um, I've seen people put their bare thumb uh, in videos uh, on after they inject. So anything that might introduce skin flora into now what you've created, which is a tiny microscopic injection hole, you want to be careful about that. So you want to be careful about other skin, touching your skin and so forth. The other thing is cleaning off the vial, making sure that's cleaned off appropriately. Um, and the other thing that we'll, we could talk about is a separate question is, is multi-use vials versus single-use vials. Um, but basically, you want to consider what's going in. So if you have a history of a staph infection, that might be an issue. Um, clean skin, obviously we talked about that as well. Um, so all of those are factors, as well as if you give them yourself versus having someone else give them and just make sure that that technique is correct. Because most of the time people are doing this themselves or they're having a buddy inject this for them. And so if you do find yourself with an infection, it's very important to kind of go back through and trace, okay, did I share this with somebody? Did, did we use the same vial and they didn't wipe the, the little cap off or did we do something like that? I'm assuming that most people, hopefully in this day and age, aren't going to be sharing needles um, so that's the difference, I think, in this population of bodybuilders that, that they know what they're doing. They have, you know, they've been doing it for years. They have sterile needles. So we're not talking about the homeless population who are sharing needles. We're talking a completely different thing. But you can still get infections, again, because the skin is covered with bacteria. You just have to, put, all you have to do is just punch, punch it in, uh, not meaning to, but it doesn't take but just a little. And then all of a sudden, the, especially if you have bleeding. So let's say the needle goes in. Now you've created a hematoma underneath. So that can get infected too. So the, the act of punching can create the injury in the skin. But then if you have bleeding, that can get infected too. Wow. And guys, we know this is, we've seen data years and years ago that, that showed that the, there was a relationship, potentially this was erroneous. It was definitely misinterpreted that steroid users are, are going to be at risk to some degree for HIV or hepatitis B or C because they're sharing needles. And that, that kind of made me very mad. And, and we ran down that, that rabbit hole for years and years to, to really stop that, that discrimination because it's, it's, it's not that it's not that it's never happened, but I, I want to, I'm here to stand up for the brothers and sisters of iron and to show that they're not stupid. And they don't want to hurt themselves. And they're not, they're not in, in there. You can't look at these people as a, 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 a part of a population of drug users. That There are some relations with the drugs and, it, you know, it's not IV. And so, but guys, even I've considered over years, I'm out of, I'm out of testosterone or steroids. I have my clean needle. Let me go to my buddy's house and just draw one. Guys, I've even thought of it. And now, you know what? In all honesty, I'm sure I've done it one or two times. Now, the danger of that is, and I'm thinking, I mean, doctor in training, this is over 20, 30 years ago, that we're going to sterilize the top. My buddy doesn't have hepatitis. He's not a drug user. He's not this and that. But you know, I know there's a lot of guys that have herpes. And so, you know, this is my infectious disease doctor in front of me, right, guys? You see the brain? You see the eyes? So I'm like, could I have gotten herpes, just type 2 herpes below the belt? Because if, if the viral load was up and, we, and there was a little blood in there, microscopic blood, because that's his supply, and I'm sharing it, not to mention worse things, 
it, it, theoretically, you, you, it's not like, hey, that's going to be sterile in there because we're always putting sterile needles in. You don't know. Maybe your buddy reused a needle once. Guys yeah. will reuse needles. So don't ever reuse a needle, not for your buddy who needs another hit, but don't reuse a needle because you're going to you could inoculate your own skin flora to grow into. I'm getting crazy now. Say, what do you think? So, well, you're probably not going to get HSV unless you inject a needle into a lesion that, but you should, you should never inject uh, yourself in a, in a place that's got a scab or anything like that. But the other thing, and I just kind of thought about this too, that, that bears to mind is that a lot of times people use more than just testosterone, right? They're using Prima Bowl, they use other things. So what if we got two or three vials out there now and we're going to oh. take our needle and we're going to draw up, you know, half CC of this, and then we're going to draw that. And so we're going right, to, we're doing, right. so we're creating potential kind of things. And so you want to make sure that the needles used to draw up. I mean, needles are not expensive in this. I mean, you know, other things are expensive, groceries are expensive, but you know, with needles, if you're, if you're going to do that, it's, it's really worth making sure that you have enough needles to draw things up and that you're being Wait a minute. Careful. I have a question, Dr. Mindy. I have a question for everyone. If, if a guy is using testosterone and masteron mm -hmm. and he's gonna use he's gonna draw the masteron up he's gonna use the same needle uh -huh. and draw up the testosterone is this bad well <clears throat> it's done so but if it's done correct so you, let's say you know you wipe them both off at the same time you use the same needle you have it on there you draw it up and you draw the other one up. I would say it's probably not ideal um, to do that I know it's done but um, when in doubt, you can use a separate needle, but then you have to make sure that you're taking the needle off and putting another in there. But if it's your own medicine, you know, it's it's probably not ideal to use the same needle with both. It's probably done yeah, though. Yeah. And then, of course, you would never use the same needle that you used to draw up that you would to inject, or you're going to bleed <laughs> really bad. So you know that the the needle. This is a viscous what the bodybuilders is it's viscous, right? So you're going to need a bigger needle to draw it up. And then you right. change to a smaller needle to inject the skin just because you've, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's pretty big. So you're, right. you're yeah. liable to breathe, to bleed more. So I'm assuming most people would know that, that you would use a different size gauge needle to draw up versus to inject um, just to make it more comfortable. But you know what? So let's, we're not going to run into too many rabbit hole guys, but we had, this is, this is about the injections and technique and it's just all part of the thing. So I use 25 gauge. I'm lazy, right? I've been doing this for over 35 years. I'm lazy. I can't micro dose any more than every five days. It's good for me. It's good for most guys. That's my 0.5, you know, Q5 simple. So, but what, what I use a 25 gauge to, to, to draw and inject that to me, that to me, the 25 gauge it's not 23, it's not 21. Some doctors that don't know this, they give 21. I've met patients for years that have been injecting a 21 gauge into their rear end and they don't know any better. They just, mm. 21 to a harpoon, you're, you're cringing. No, <laughs> it's out there. Thing. I've even done a 21 because mm -hmm. I had no choice in the matter because I was like, I need my injection. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm, it's, this is how, how like we're kind of like drug guys. I mean, it's kind of a more mental thing, I think like, and then you only have like you're looking through the drawers and you got to call the doctor. It's like, oh, shit, I got 21 left, you know, so do you use a harpoon? So but some guys. So uh, so if you're using around, if you're using 20, anything, you know, anything larger, 27 is great. You're not you. Some guys, 29 and 30 insulin syringes, you could sit there for a long time and get a viscous oil ester into a, a one ice where you can. I've done it, but it takes like an hour. It takes like mm -hmm, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now I know guys will, you could warm it up, right? Guys have every trip. This is a fascinating underground that's mm -hmm. above ground now. So needle sizes, right? I don't like to change the needles because you lose it. You lose it in the hub. It takes time. The pharmacies can be like, hey, now you're coming up short. And it's right. like, well, the guy, Okay, so guys, so okay, now we talked about so injection technique. Do you t tell us about injection technique? What, see, we're moving along, but benign. We're going to make it. You're going to know what's benign, what's not. Here's the doctor. We're both doctors, and then we're going to go into like the. We're getting into the selection of 
of antimicrobials. This is fascinating because the boss is right here. So infectious disease expert. So do you do we need to aspirate? I do not aspirate because I don't need I don't need to. Do we need to aspirate? People always ask me that question. Well, the risk of, of not, of course, the risk of not is that if you is injecting into a blood vessel or, or into a place where you have a vascular thing. So if you pull back and get blood, then you, you would not want to inject there. So most of the time, if you're doing it right or sub-Q or, or IM, you shouldn't do that. But then off case, you, know, you inject a little bit and see if you have a flash of blood. That's sort of what, so what God, But do. I think if you're, if you're good at this, and you know your body's, you know, th there's so much, there's so much muscle up here. Mm -hmm. And if you can get to it, right, some guys are so freaking big, they can't mm -hmm. even get, they have to have someone help. That's a whole nother. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't pull back, you're handing one hand, it's hard right. to keep it. So, but how much, how many big vessels are in this, this, this rich, deep muscle? So, so most of the time you're, I mean, it'd be a vein or something that you're, I mean, you're not going to get an artery there. I mean, but you just, they're, they're blood, uh, blood vessels and things there too. So that's just, um, most people probably don't pull back. They might pull back just a little bit and then inject, but. You could do it guys, but it's not, but so my, I'm just trying to give all the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I'd say when you're injecting the legs, let's talk about, let's talk the glue. You know, I can never get back to there cause I'm so tight and I just never, I've never done one injection, maybe one or two in the glue or the anterior glue. It was never my thing. I'm a deltoid guy or I'm a leg guy. Now the legs are tight, right? The legs are the legs are tough because there's sweet spots. And my nurse, nurse Wendy, has shown me the best technique in all our patients. There's certain re areas that it's that it's that distal lateral and la vastus lateralis that just just a little distal where you find it around the edge, guys. When she paints the clock on it, and she's like one o'clock over to the between one and two o'clock. And it's just like right there. But if you do it medially or you do it in the IT band, I, it, I've had infections or hematomas or I, I've hit nerves and then I've got squirters. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that's an artery, I guess. Right. Because we're going. Well, I don't know if it's an artery, but baby artery, did you use the 21 gauge then? <laughs> no, 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 I'm using my 23 gauge that I don't like. I don't like 23. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that again, that's, that's kind of knowing your body, but, but that's why people are prone to getting infections, obviously, because we've just discussed a wide range of techniques that people could potentially have. And so I think that's important for those of you out there. And the article that I found, found there, and there's really a paucity of, of this in the literature of actual, um, in like testosterone or the uh, performance enhancing drug related in fact, there's just not that many. We have plenty on IV drug users. We have plenty on other things. But so I did find an article where they, they interviewed like 366 uh, patients that did this. And they found that when they kind of got down to it, about mm, 6% or so would actually have infections like abscesses and other things like that. So there's not a whole lot there, but there is a wide range. So if, if you find yourself in that position, it's very important. This is what we do in infection control, actually. You have to go back and figure out, okay, now what have I been doing wrong? Have I not been cleaning this off? Did I let somebody else do this? Did I did I use uh, a multi-dose vial? Was it the 30th time that I had gone in there or the 10th time or whatever that I had accessed this vial over and over again because you're punching a hole in it with the needle, that kind of thing. Um, so I think all of those things are important to look at. All right, so let's get into the, we're, we're, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty heavy duty stuff. Let me, let me start off with an example. I was a National Geographic, I believe it was, yeah, Nat Geo, with a patient that it was a pretty wild Nat Geo, right, with Tony Huge and all that. And there's a guy that was a patient of my, still a patient of mine. I don't want to say names, but he did not mind being a Nat Geo. You guys could research this. We'll try to put some clips up here for you. Trailer. Guy is in his 30s. He's a big boy, big steroid guy, but he's just a cool dude and he's not a pro, but he wants to be a pro and he's just a regular guy, businessman, smart man, married to a doctor, married to a hem hematology oncology fellow at that, at a fellow mm -hmm. at that time. And she's not in the industry like us, right? In the fitness business and the extreme shit. He's injecting. You ready for this? He's injecting. Glute guy, his gear. He gets an infection in the glute. It's not even the first one. He's had them before. They go away. They go away. He puts heating packs on them or ice packs, maybe both. Okay. It doesn't go away. What does he do? Because he needs to keep injecting. He's just letting that sit. He's, he's injecting the other side, the other glute. 
He ends up, I think after three or four weeks, maybe a month, I'm not kidding. His rear end, he said, he goes, man, look at my rear end. He's like, see my, I mean, he has pictures of his rear end that was physically distended where he's like, look at my rear end. It's like an awesome rear. It's, I mean, the guys, are, I can't believe what I saw in the pictures. And his wife says, you have, demands he goes to the emergency room. He, he was admitted to the hospital, St. Francis Hospital. I'll tell you, it's, I can tell you the hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, one of my hospitals. And he was there for one month. Okay, one month. He had he had three doctors that took care of him. Mm -hmm. He had a hospitalist, internal medicine. Mm -hmm. He had infectious disease doctor, mm -hmm. like you. And who else did he have? I hope general surgery. <laughs> he had general surgery. <laughs> he had general surgery, and they removed. They removed Probably more than a half. Lot. Yeah. They removed over the course of time more than half of his rear end, gluteus maximus. Yes. Probably media, probably the, mean, the minus, the medius, they probably, they have removed a lot of his rear end. And he made it through. And at the end of his stay, when he was getting ready to be discharged, his wife is a doctor, called up my office and said, Dr. O'Connor, well, I was like this emergency call, come, nah, you know, I mean, the doctor's on the phone and I don't pick up my phone. So my staff said, hey, doc, you got a new patient uh, consult, looks like, and she's a doctor, and she's got she really wants to. I usually don't talk to people. We're busy, you know. I, I and I let me talk to her. Hey, Doctor O'Connor, I'm I'm a big fan, and you're you please take a patient who's my husband. He's a big fan of yours too. He should have come to you years ago, and um, he's in the hospital, and he's getting right. And she told me the story. I took him on, and we ended up getting in National Geographic together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so. Can you please explain what this man did wrong? And then we're going to go into the antibiotics. So it, it's difficult to know exactly what he did wrong, but I can tell you what he probably had. And and again, that this relates to everything that we've done. So infections are on a spectrum from what we're dealing with with injections. So you can have something little that's a little inflamed up to a very large um, infection that sounds like necrotizing fasciitis or the uh, very scary uh, flesh-eating bacteria, which if you really boil it down, is usually the germ that causes strep throat. So it's usually when a common germ gets out of control and that's a problem. So probably the, the first thing he, he didn't do or he did do was he sat on it, no pun intended, but he, he sat on it too long and it got out of hand. And so um, we're talking about common skin infections most of the time because injection is going through the skin. Um, so the skin has normal flora. Not all of the skin germs on the skin are equal. So some, if they get into a supposedly sterile site, can wreak more havoc. This is why, because the bloodstream ought to be sterile. So this is why if you have a staph infection in the bloodstream or a, a group A strep, which causes strep throat, it's going to be a little bit different than a, a coag negative staph, what we call like staph epidermidis. So they're all flavors of ice cream, so to speak. They're all flavors of skin germs. It's just that some, I tell people that when you leave your door open, meaning when you open your skin or puncture your skin, it's like inviting the criminals next door. But some of the criminals, you know, have misdemeanors and some of them are mass murderers. And so some of these germs, same thing. So more than likely he had a type of necrotizing skin infection, which can be a common germ that you wouldn't even think about. It sounds scary when you say necrotizing fasciitis or flesh eating, but that means simply that a germ that we all have gets just in the wrong place at the wrong time because wow. your skin's protecting you most of the time and your immune system. But if you get in there, if that germ gets on certain kind of planes and gets in those fascial layers and the fat, it just goes to town. And so that's probably what happened. And what, and what you need then is a general surgeon because you literally have to stop it above where the infection is. So you just keep having to just, just, debris, 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 which is a fancy word for cutting away, hacking, that kind of thing, until you get to healthy bleeding tissue. And so you think about the glutes, you're going to have a lot of fat there and, and muscle there too. So there's a lot of potential for destruction there too. And, you know, it's, it's on the gluteus. So you're sitting and that kind of thing too. So you've got a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of things going on there, but it sounds like it got out of hand. And the other question I have is whether or not he was injecting both sides. And so one of the other things I would recommend not doing is that let's say you have a big syringe, you're trying to give yourself a, a dose, 
don't split dose. Don't don't take and do half here and half there without cleaning all the sides. I mean, I'd use separate needles. So that, I don't know if he did that because you said he was going the other side. So I don't know if that meant he just switched sides or was he injecting in one and the I other? Don't know. So, so, so guys, don't do that. So do one side at a time, isolate the needle and just, you got to be, use needles. That's the bottom line. Use, buy tons of needles. The other thing about needles, and I'll just say this, if you do get an infection, that's the time when you don't use a needle. So a lot of people will say, well, I've got a little a bowl. I'm going to take this needle. It's sterile. I'm going to, or I'm going to take it and run it through the flame, put alcohol on it. So when you have a pus-producing organism like staph or strep, um, it's, I tell people it's kind of like trying to drink an ice cream milkshake out of a coffee straw. Um, you're taking a, a needle and you're trying to puncture what a very viscous thick pus and all you're doing is just pushing it all in the skin layers and so that's why you need a surgeon to actually use a clean blade to cut things open um of course i have patients tell me that they they use their pocket knife which i would also not recommend so people do all kinds of crazy oh. things but it, but bottom line is that if you have an infection or think you do go see the doctor don't stick a needle in it i don't care what you did i don't care if you put it through a flame or alcohol or sterile don't stick a needle in because a staph infection what will happen people do that and the next day it blows up so because you you've aggravated it so people will say and this is how we a lot of times diagnose staph infection with even out of cultures that someone say hey listen it started like a pimple and i picked at it and then my whole arm blew up and that's that's kind of that's what we're talking about. So, so these germs are not to be messed with literally. So, and that can lead us into some antibiotic, you know, what, okay. what we would think so, about. So, okay. So now we go into the end, the, you got a bad infect, you got, you got the testosterone injection gone bad, bring people through professionally, clinically. What, what, what is it? What is it where, how much time, is, and if I get it, if you got the call, you got to go. If she's in the hospital. That's not an emergency. <laughs> all right. That's it's all live, guys. It's all well. It's recorded. So, okay, Dr. Mindy, you have a bad infection. You have a bad injection. I'll call you right back. Sorry. <laughs> this is a list. Don't cut this out. Don't edit this, you guys. All right. So you have, but is everyone okay? Okay. Everyone's right. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have a bad injection. You're not sure if it's just a reaction, it's a hemat a little bleeding, it's just a, a, a reaction, a reaction to propanate, right? Or some react, it's a bad steroid, it burns, you know, like, like testosterone suspension back in the day, propanates, this is stuff that hurts. So it's like, oh, it just hurts, I gotta suck it up. I gotta suck it up, buttercup. So now bring us through with, with symptoms and time how is it going to progress and at what time are we going to start the antibiotic and then we're going to go into how we make a decision this is going to be for doctors listening be careful i don't want to give bad advice this is not advice it's, it's information but we're going to we're going to blow you away with the current day of antibiotic selection it's beyond me i can't, even i'm a good doctor but this is the boss so tell us how, how do we make a decision that we need an antibiotic. This is for doctors here. So first of all, with the patient, you want to make sure that they, obviously they have an infection. So, um, and it depends on if you do oral or IV as to whether, as how sick they are. So if someone comes in sick and has fever, that's more of the IV route, go to the hospital. If they come in, they have a boil, um, at that point, you want to, you want to know what their, what their history of infections. Most people can tell you, oh, I've had MRSA before I've had MRSA. If that is the case, then I'm sorry, the helicopters, um, hang on. <laughs> oh boy. If that's the case and they do have a history of a staph infection, then you would want to choose an antibiotic that would cover MRSA because that is part of their natural skin flora. It doesn't mean they did anything wrong. It's just they happen to carry staph aureus on their skin. So if they're having an injection, there's a good chance that that may be a potential culprit. So you want to cover that. So MRSA or MRSA drugs orally would include potentially, uh, there's still some resistance, but doxycycline. Bactrim, and then there's a one called linazolid. So those, and, and plus or minus clindamycin. Clindamycin covers some MRSA, but not all. We've lost over time a lot of susceptibilities for some of these antibiotics that we've used in the past. But clindamycin is a good skin drug. It's a good strep drug, that kind of thing. 
if you have just sensitive staph or if you're not sure, you never had a staph infection, that's when Keflex would be appropriate. Um, and then you have to watch it. So if it's not better or if it's getting worse, at that point, it may be more than just cellulitis. You may have an abscess. So if it starts to get fluctuant or starts what we call pointing, so you can kind of see there's pus under there, at that point it may need, may need to be lanced. And again, this is not a needle lancing. This is a lancing with the blade where it's cleaned so that you create a hole that's big enough to get the viscous pus out. And so at that point, you can take a culture. So you can't really culture the skin because you're it's not going to help you. You need to culture. If you have pus or something like that, you can do that. But you can't really, um, you don't just want to culture the skin. So a lot of this is what we call empiric therapy. That means you're guessing. And that's why it's important to know the patient's history. So if you're sick, have fever, if it's large, if it's getting bigger, at that point, you need IV antibiotics and go to the emergency room and have general surgery look at it. That's the, that's the, worst case scenario end of the spectrum and then you've got the the you know the this has been bothering me for you know a day or it's not getting better kind of thing fever is a, a, a big deal and then once you get the antibiotic let's say you get keflex it's not better it's getting worse you're feeling worse the uh, you can also use a marker a surgical marker to kind of draw an outline if the redness extends then you know you may not be on the right track so you've got the wrong antibiotic or it needs to be opened up by a general surgeon. So those are things just to kind of look for um, in those types of infections. All right, so let's go to the basics then to wrap up here. So, because th th again, this is, this is a channel f not for medical advice, it's a channel for education and for people to be aware of what they could be working on and getting maybe for their own supply, because I'm a harm reduction doctor, I'm a harm reduction. And I, but I always want to be respectful to regulators, regulation, regu doctors and regulators to be very appropriate. I never want to make bad videos. So people could, I would recommend you talk to your doctors or nurse practitioners and maybe have on hand and God knows in the future when, you know, it's kind of like the survivor doc stuff, right? It's like crazy, you know, do, how do we differentiate with, in fact, with, with, if they have MRSA, right, and even I, I have MRSA up here because I was checked because mm -hmm. I worked in hospitals forever, right? So mm -hmm. when you go for big procedures and surgical, they want to mm -hmm. know that, right? Very interesting from mm -hmm. the surgeons. So that's beyond the scope of this, but it, it is interesting, guys. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. So if, if, you're, if you've never had the, the guy, the gal never has, and if they don't know about MRSA or any they've otherwise healthy person, allergies, do you have penicillin allergies? Mm -hmm. Do you have tetracycline allergies? Mm -hmm. Do you have allergies? So, so the basic drug a lot of the bodybuilder coaches they're going to use is, and it's not really wrong, but they, they obviously, this is for them. This is for everyone. So, because you're the boss. So is Keflex mm -hmm. could be very good. Talk about Keflex. It's a, it's a third generation cephalosporin so it's, a, right? it's a first generation cephalosporin <laughs> and it has gram positive coverage so it's it's more narrow which we like in the id world we like to use a narrow spectrum antibiotic meaning i'm not trying to kill every germ on your body i'm trying to kill what's causing your infection i'm trying to use the shortest course that i can that will get rid of the infection so that I don't mess up your microbiome, that I don't give you unnecessary antibiotics. And so, and I also realize that we you know this audience is bodybuilders. So you probably have a lot of people who, who don't even want to take antibiotics. They're, not, they're into natural kind of things. And I totally get that, but we're talking about life-threatening or potential life-threatening. So the thing about abscesses or anything with pus in there is that that can always be seated in the bloodstream. So that's why you want to be careful. Yeah. Uh, with that. So Keflex is a reasonable first choice because it covers skin really well. And then you just, sometimes you just have to watch and wait. If it's getting better, it's likely working. And if it's not, you got to do something else. So I think you have to be hyper vigilant because you don't always know what you're dealing with. Um, the other thing, if it's not getting better on the standard skin germs, then you need to get a culture. And if you're having fever, you need blood cultures to make sure you haven't already gotten a systemic infection in the bloodstream. But no one, but no, okay, Doc, this is stuff people are, I have, I have fans, we have people here, viewers in countries, they, they're not going to be able to get to the hospital. Maybe they live far away. Maybe they don't have the resources. So, so now, it's a, Keflex is a first generation cephalosporin mm -hmm. that's a beta, it's a beta lactam. Mm -hmm. There is potential, if you have a penicillin allergy, tell us, guys, you've got to listen to this. 
is it true? So many people say they have a penicillin allergy, but the truth is there's a lot of studies on this. They don't. Right. They don't. So this could be life. This is life threatening. I have a penicillin allergy. I can't take any beta lactams. And they're like, well, Charlie, we got to say goodbye. You know, so please respond to that. So that's a very good question because we have a lot of people who have quote unquote penicillin allergies. And so, um, and sometimes they don't remember. So again, this is, this is history. If they remember a specific time when they had anaphylaxis, they had trouble breathing, shortness of breath, that's, that's legit. And I would probably not give a cephalosporin or a penicillin. If it, they're not sure, if it's, if it's, I had a little rash or they're just not sure, the cross-reactivity exists between the penicillin class and the cephalosporins, but it's not as much as you think. It's probably less than 10%. So most of the time, if you, can t if you can't take a penicillin, you might be able to take a cephalosporin and vice versa. Right. It's just that you don't want to, to do that unless you have a really reasonable, because we're not trying to harm anyone. We want to make sure we give them the right thing. But right. a lot of times there, there may not be a lot of choices. So I'll have the pharma, like in the hospital, for example, I'll have the pharmacist, hey, look back and say, hey, listen, this person has a penicillin allergy, but can they take Keflex or Rocephin, which are cephalosporins? Can they take those? Have they taken those successfully? And a lot of times we'll find that they've actually taken penicillin successfully and it's not even a problem at all right. because, uh, you know, especially with the rash population, because a lot of people get told as a child that they have a rash and it could have been a viral exanthem. I mean, and who knows? So um, personally, I had to get tested because I couldn't get rid of strep throat when I had twins. And so I finally went to my uh, allergist friend and I said, listen, I I've got to be able to take penicillin. I'm, I'm not getting over my strep throat. So I wasn't allergic. I was just told because I think I had viral exanthems. I was a rashy kind of girl. So there's all kinds of things in there, which is why you have to have a really good history of history. taking care of patients and making sure um, history of MRSA is important. There are alternatives if you cannot take penicillin for staff. So, so kind of my, okay. So, so the big, the big, the big broad brush strokes here. So for a regular guy, penis, probably not even penicillin allergy, right? Or definitely not like a heavy, you know, anaphylactic, and they could take it. No, our no known drug allergies. For if you don't have MRSA history, it's a good choice to start with. It's four grams, right? It's one gram, four times. It's one gram, 1,000 milligrams, four, to, four. The Keflex four. is usually 500 milligrams four times a day. So it's, so it's two, two grams in one right. day. So it's 500 four times a day. Usually that's, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive with the oral doses. Right. Um, clindamycin can be dosed three times a day or four times a day. Depending hold on, on Clint, the dose. hold on. So, so I just, for people to understand, so first choice, if we're just gambling for the average bear, it's still a good, Keflex is still a good effect. It's reasonable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you watch it. Now, mm -hmm. let's go. I like Doxy. I give Doxy to a lot of my guys. Let's go to Doxy. So doxycycline is going to cover um, your MRSA and MSSA, so it's a, it's a good one. It's just that you don't need to go to, you know, do one of your NPC shows and then go out on the beach. Uh, or you're going to get photosensitivity with doxy, so you just have to be careful with that. Um, but, yeah, doxy is a reasonable choice as well. So doxycycline, it's 100 milligrams twice a day. Um, make sure there are no drug allergies. And for the women, I always have to recommend that make sure that, you know, if they're in any kind of contra or contraceptives or anything that they use, um, the secondary protection if they're on antibiotics. How, how long do we treat for? That depends, and that's a good question. Um, in the ID world, we're trying to use as as limited as we can on duration. So that's what you, how long is, what is the duration? So five to seven days, seven to 10 days, it just kind of depends on how bad. We're talking about skin and soft tissue infections, which for the most part are gonna be minor. I would say probably, most people aren't going to end up like your your client, your patient that had the the terrible necrotizing infection. So five to seven days is reasonable. Um, if it's not better at that point, you may need to do something else anyway. So I think those are reasonable times. I don't. I personally, even I'm an ID doctor, I don't like giving antibiotics to folks because I like for them to have their natural bacteria. So I like to use as as narrow spectrum, meaning I want to cover just for the staff or just as little as I can. And we call that streamlining or narrow coverage. And then you want to use a short duration to get the job done. Love it. All right. So that covers Keflex, Doxy for more MRSA. It's also a good medicine for someone who doesn't have MRSA because it's going to cover that, that select uh, population, mm -hmm. right, of staff mm -hmm. and strep. Um, and then Bactrim, Sulfadrol, Bactrim. 
Bactrim's going to be your MRSA drug. It'll cover MSSA, it won't cover streps. And so if you think you just have MRSA, it's it's okay. Um, so 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 a lot of people, a lot of these, the, so again, this is for the coaches. So so th that's going to be limited. Bactrim, they like that sometimes, but because it's good for the urinary tract infection for the girl, I guess. But it's just not a good drug to start because it's limited. So Doxy's better. Keflex is better. Now, clindamycin, I always think the days in med school where you're going to get uh, pseudomembranitis colitis. C. diff. Am I right? C. diff. Right. Well, is that true? Clindamycin is a good, a great drug, though. Clindamycin. I had a bad infection. I went to the hospital. It, well, I gave myself everything. I ran the whole gamut. And then I went to the ER, and I had an ER doctor who loved me, and she's like, She's like, I'm giving you, I was like, clenomycin. She was like, yeah, just trust me. And it went away. So if you have strep throat or you have not, not because there are other things for strep throat, but basically group A strep that causes strep throat, clenomycin would be. So clenomycin might be something. Again, we don't know what a lot of these people are going to have unless you have an actual culture. So clen is a, a decent skin drug. But we do see resistance to staph. So if it's not getting better, it might not be the right one. Right. Bactrim is decent for for staph or staph aureus. Um, so that's a decent one. So again, a lot of th there's not. That's why you have me. There's not a lot, you know, or your nurse practitioner or primary care. There, there's not really a cookbook where you can say if you have this, do this. You really have to use your clinical judgment. And I think right. That's so I'm going. So with this video, I'm going with Keflex. I'm looking for stock up on Keflex and Doxy. That's what I'm looking for, guys. And this, I got to because I got to make things easy for people. Linazolid, can we talk? Linazolids can be expensive, but linazolid is an MRSA drug, MSSA, strep. So it's going to cover a lot of different things. Um, so that's one of those things that you use um, when you start pulling out when people have sulfur allergies, they can't take Bactrim. They have a penicillin allergy. Um, but they have something. So that's one of those things. That's a different drug class that you can try. And a lot of times with good RX now, people can get prescription. I mean, they can get. But it's expensive. Tell us how expensive it could be. Well, it depends. It depends on, on where you can find the deal. If your insurance will cover it, or you can get good RX. But it can be hundreds of thousands, you know, of dollars. But it can also be be you know inexpensive, relatively speaking, if you have a good RX. So you never know. So it's always good to check. Um, but it's always good for doctors and for, for you know, for your nurses to, to call the pharmacy ahead of time and say, hey, listen, I'm prescribing this drug, uh, how much it's going to cost? Because the patient gives the pharmacy and it's, you know, $500, but I, we, we have gross size. So we, we have some guys that have some money here, right? So for the right. rich guys, I'm not kidding. I got some, we got some guys with money and uh, doomsday guys, right? End of the world. Linazolid, any side effects, any, any problems? Yes, for, for a prolonged use of a linazolid, you would. So I don't like to give it longer than I have to, like longer than two weeks, because you can have some um, some bone marrow suppression with it. Your platelet, you can have thrombocytopenia, which is lower platelets. You can have some anemia with it. You can have some peripheral neuropathy with it. But look, I can tell you side effects on every drug we've talked about. They all so well, linazolid. The main thing is it's not a it's not a great long term drug. It's a good I it's a good you. five seven ten day drug. Uh, for people who have a staph infection or have a severe infection, that they need something that they can't take the normal. Right, but it's for drug, but for but with, with with increasing drug resistance, we're here to give you guys the best information. All right, I think that's it, Dr. Mindy. Wow, wow, this is a long video, but it is it's just for the hardcore guys. They're going to watch the whole thing and wait to the end. Thank you so much for pleasure for being here. Really Thank appreciate you. It. We'll we'll do more together for sure.